let me uh, express my thanks to God for being able to come back here 44 years later. I stand today with tears of pain and joy. I remember so well being here with H. Ralph Jackson at Claiborne Temple. We met and we marched here with uh, Bill Luce and Jerry Worth, Reverend Benjamin Hooks, Reverend Samuel Billy Kyles, Reverend Jim Lawson, as we engaged to fight this fight 44 years ago. I remember so well, Bill Horton, that that Saturday before coming to Memphis, Brother King said, I have great agony within my soul. I've been under attack because of my fight for poor people, because of my fight for the end of the war. We should shift from killing in Vietnam to healing at home. The dropping bombs in Vietnam will close down our cities. He said, one, that was I thought about after 13 years, maybe I've done as much as I could do. Maybe I'll just quit. If I quit now and maybe go to Moore House as its president or something of the sort, the Harriet Tubman and those who never gave up would not understand my quitting, and so I, I can't quit. I remember Andy Young saying, Doc, don't, don't talk that way. He said, well, I've had a migraine headache. That's the way I feel. Let, don't say peace, peace, when there is no peace. He then said, I thought maybe if I would fast and pray to the point of death, our movement has become so divided Leaders would come around me, from Rap Brown to Stokely to McKissick to Jim Farmer to Ron Wilkins. Put the arm against top and pray together to revive the strength of our struggle. He then said, we must turn the minus into a plus and move on up the King's Highway and go on to Memphis. I remember so well, Reverend Nettles, because the parallel was Jesus saying, let this cup pass from me. And as he prayed, his disciples slept, and neither some of our staff members slept, and then nothing that will be done. It was around Easter season. Now he has gone on to glory and left us to, to tell the story of his unfinished business. I said to Mel Warden a few weeks ago, Memphis has not had its rightful place in this King drama. So we focus so much on the birthplace which has its rightful place in Atlanta, Georgia. But as significant as Bethlehem was, our redemption is at Calvary. As significant as where Mandela was born, redemption was in Roberts Island. As significant as Atlanta is, the crucifixion took place in Memphis. And not far from the crucifixion, you will find the resurrection. There's power in Memphis because there's blood in Memphis. He did not choose to be born in Atlanta. He chose to come to Memphis. He chose to come for the working and for the poor. He chose to give it up right here in Memphis. This is Easter season. And we must move on from the stone to the resurrection. New hope and new challenges. 44 years later. I've heard it said over and over again, probably 44 years. Maybe it's trauma. Members has had a hard time dealing with Dr. King's assassination. For some, it's pain and shame. Others, it's humiliation. Others, it's just confusion. But New Testament was written 75 to 125 years after Jesus was, was, was killed. They didn't write the New Testament the next year, the next year. I think those you said Mark was around 75 years later. And so the New Testament was written about 100 years after he was gone. Somehow Memphis is still in trauma. Memphis is still in mourning. And somehow we must now look at how we turn pain to power. As I looked at the young people singing in their hoodies, we go from Martin King to Trayvon Martin, from one Martin to another. Amen, amen. Both shot down in cold blood. Yes. Lives spill unnecessarily. Yes. The question becomes as we even name the street after him today, and Brother Boyd, we're so grateful to you for your sensitivity. He said on the last sermon at Mason Temple, I've had honors and degrees, and but that doesn't matter very much to me now. What matters to me is to do 
God's will. Yes, sir. How do we worship? We worship by giving calves and rams and rivers of oil. How do we worship? Oh man, you know what's good. Do justice. Do love mercy. What's the substance of the proposition today? It is this, as we gather in Tennessee today, 16% of African Americans in this state, prisons 60%. How do we worship today? Mississippi, 27% black, prison, 76% black. How do we worship today? What is our agenda? Here, as we gather on the street corner today, 950,000 Tennesseans have no health insurance. Yeah. And they fight against health insurance. Yeah. How do we worship today? A million, 200,000 in this state have our own food stamps. And they put down the president for fighting for food stamps. For those were the day to sink the ship just to destroy the captain. And the struggle, therefore, continues. What is our unfinished business? To fight the poverty, to fight race profiling, to fight the violence. We're much too violent. I close Brother Harrington on this simple note, which hurts me so very much. We lost 306,000 soldiers in Iraq in 10 years. We lose 30,000 a year at home, 30,000 a kill a year. We keep on bringing the AK 47s. 11, 11, 11. They shot an AK 47 in the White House. President Barack was not there on that day. And so these streets remain violent. Yes. 100,000 injured a year and 30,000 a kill. It's time for change. It's time to stop the violence. It's time to change our mind about violence. You know and I know, you look at the Trayvon Martin phenomenon. If a black kills a white, it's jail time. If a white kills a black, it's revolt time. If a black kill black, a white kill white, it's miller time. Nobody has the right to kill anybody. We must stop all the violence and, and give an excuse nowhere. As so I say in Dr. King's name, let's stand on this corner and recommit ourselves to stop the violence. Yeah. Revive the ban on assault weapons. Stop the violence. Yes. Stop neighborhood killing. Yeah. Stop the violence. Yeah. Stop suspending our children from school and educate them. Yeah. Stop the violence. Yes. Love each other. Yeah. Stop banks from foreclosing our houses. Stop the violence. Yes. Keep hope alive. Long live the legacy and work and unfinished business of Martin Luther King. God bless you. Jackson. Let's give him a big hand for being here. And last and certainly not least is our own brother, our own member, Lithian, someone who has represented this city in many capacities, and who's led this city uncharted waters. Someone who represents strength. Someone who has fought for the least of these. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Willie W. Harrington.
Thank God for this beautiful day. Thank God for this occasion. Thank God for all who have come to assemble on this momentous occasion. Let me give thanks to the two young men who gave tremendous leadership to this event. Let me also give thanks to members of the Memphis City Council who made this tribute happen here today. To the 100 black men, Ron Wedwin, thank you for your leadership. To all of the members of the clergy that are here today, as you will remember, Dr. King was a preacher. Rabbi Greenstein, let me congratulate you on your honor by being respected among rabbis across the nation. We honor you on this occasion as well. My mind goes back when Rabbi Wax, many of you if you're not 70 years old or older, you may not know Rabbi Wax. You may not, you may have heard about Henry Lowe, as Reverend Nettles explained. Rabbi Wax was one of those soldiers who fought for justice with Ralph Jackson. And what was the Catholic leader, Reverend Natters, who was also very able, Frank McRae, who I think is still alive. We had some men of faith who truly believed in equality and dignity for all of God's children. So I want to recognize that. Berlin asked me to just reflect on what Dr. King meant to me. And I want to do that. I was 28 years old. 28 years old. When I made a transformation from boyhood to manhood. I was confronted with a very serious decision. And it was in regards to whether or not I would support the sanitation workers, march with Dr. King. I was a young principal then, Ron. And I was told that if I wanted to choose the path of being a black militant, that the Memphis City School System had no place for a black militant. And I remember I was married and I had two little boys. And I had to struggle with doing what the white leadership demanded was for me to relinquish who I was. Being an African man of pride and I had to struggle with whether or not I would acquiesce to the power structure or would I do God's will and to fight for justice and I made a decision that I would march with Dr. King. I remember vividly Berlin wearing a sign, I am a man. And you children don't understand why would men wear a sign, I am a man. We were male. Why, why would a black man have to wear a sign saying I am a man when you, you knew you were a man? But you, you were not respected as a man. You were, you, were, you were looked upon as being less than a man. So we wore a sign conveying to Mayor Loeb and to everybody in Memphis who looked at us as less than being men that we were men. That's why that sign, I am a man. Dr. King Berlin, in the midnight hour, and I had to pray on this, whether I would be a good boy, work with the system, or would I be a man, so that when my children looked at me, they could see a man and not a boy. So Berlin, what Dr. King meant to me, he caused me to undergo a transformation to boyhood to manhood. I also want to share this with you. 
I remember when we stood in front of City Hall. I stood there, 28 years old, protesting against Mayor Lowe. I never envisioned Reverend Netters, Reverend Jackson, when I stood in front of City Hall, protesting against Mayor Lowe. The Father's imagination was that one day the God that I serve would enable one who grew up 12 blocks from here, no father in the home, two room shack, but out of the dust of South Memphis would rise and go into City Hall and not just go there and occupy a seat, but to make a difference. That's what happened. But if you had asked me, when I was standing there in protest, would I ever be a mayor? Father's thing from my mind. So what Dr. King meant to me, and I want you all to know, I know often I'm misunderstood. Once you leave boyhood and you become a man, all your decisions become easy to make. Once you get over that trepidation of, of stepping out on truth, then you're scared no longer. But if you never make that transition, if you never make that transition, you'll never have any strength. You'll never respect what manhood really, really means. Now, I want to leave you with this. Dr. King wrote a book. It was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Community or Chaos? How many of you remember that book? It was an interesting question. Where do we go from here? Community or chaos? That question is still relevant. After the dedication of the street, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? What did Dr. King die for? Is his dreams still worth fighting for and pursuing? Now, I love Memphis, Tennessee. That's why I'm here. All of Memphis may not love me, but I love all of Memphis. Memphis has made progress, but I want to tell all of y'all today, this dedication is just one step forward. We still have a long way to go. I want to thank the two young men and the council that gave leadership. And I want to thank all of you all for showing up and let us truly come together and make Memphis a city of good abode. God bless all of you. Thank you for coming. Come in. God is good. All the time. 
and all the time. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here on this afternoon. It is a privilege standing in front of you today as we prepare for the unveiling of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. I want to take 10 seconds of a personal privilege to say that I'm a proud person being up here and fraternally, and I know the mayor does not mind me saying this, I'm a proud fraternal member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. I love you too, Reverend Jackson. <laughs> but for all of my alphas that are here, thank you for being here. We know that Dr. King was a true servant of all. And, <laughs> thank you. And as we look at this historical context, ladies and gentlemen, that has preceded this event, it is important that we acknowledge why we are here today and to ensure that this day is not trivialized. Dr. Netters was up here a minute ago and he gave us some of the history. Now over 40 years ago, we know that African American sanitation workers had to work extra time just to be equal to their counterparts. They had to work during days of inclement weather. Talking about thunderstorms, which we don't have right now, praise God. Snowstorms and ice storms. They did not have the luxury of their white counterparts to stay at home and receive paid leave. They were also paid significantly less because of the color of their skin. That blatant discrimination resulted in a sanitation strike. And approximately 44 years ago, Dr. King marched on this very street where we are right now in support of the striking African-American sanitation workers. And we know at 6.01 p.m. tonight, that will mark the 44th anniversary exactly of when Dr. King shed his blood here in our city. In 1971, just like Dr. Netters um, told us, the city of Memphis renamed a part of Highway 51. Now check this out. Renamed a part of Highway 51 out after Elvis Presley, who was still living at the time. That vote passed by a majority of the Memphis City Council. And Dr. Netters, pastor of Mount Vernon Baptist Church Westwood and a councilman at that time, was desirous of a corridor being named after the late Dr. King. Last night at the unveiling gala, and Dr. Netters was my guest speaker, he was a wonderful speaker. If you were there, you got something out of him. He expressed the racial polarity that existed then where his wish of a street name change was not fulfilled. He expressed that white council members at that time did not want their constituents to receive an affirmative vote on a renaming then as a sympathetic vote. Instead, a portion of the interstate was named after the great civil rights leader. Ladies and gentlemen, that was 1971. Let's look 40 years later. Although that same polarity may exist in small circles, let's look at the significant changes that this point in time has been made in our dear city. Then, the African American sanitation workers had to endure incorrigible working conditions and unequal pay. Now all workers are required to have equal pay and equal privileges. But just like the Reverend Dwight Montgomery said up here, the work is not done. The work is not done. Then the idea of having a mayor of color in a predominantly African-American city may have seemed implausible. Now the city has had four, and, it, and I have a privilege of having three in front of us right now. That deserves some applause. And from a broader scope, the idea of electing a black president then probably was unrealistic. Now we have a man in the White House named Barack Obama. <laughs> then there were only a small handful of African American council members in the city of Memphis. Today they make up the majority. However, even though that majority exists, while Berlin and I were on this venture, 
There were others outside of that realm that still had negative speculation that even in the year 2012, the idea of renaming a street after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would probably either have one or two things. It would, either, it would be a continued impossibility or it would have been another expression of polarity. Today that singular concern can finally come to rest. I'm honored to say that on December 20th of last year, Councilman Berlin Bowen with I as the co-sponsor unanimously had it passed requesting an official name change of Linden Street between Front Street and Danny Thomas to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. And Mr. Bowen, we are appreciative. But that was just the beginning, ladies and gentlemen. On February 21st of this year, the entire Memphis City Council, without the polarity, by a unanimous 13 to 0 vote, approved the entire extension of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue. A man of this significant importance, ladies and gentlemen, did not just deserve a part of Linden Avenue to be named after him. A man of this magnitude deserved the entire street to be named after him on this day. And Councilman, I believe at that point we're going to move over. Okay. Memphis, good afternoon. Thank you so much for showing out and showing up. Memphis today marks a day of bridging the beliefs of many dreamers who has come before us. 44 years ago today, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sacrificed his life, not for the selfish reasons of notoriety or fortune, but for the sake of bridging the gap of social equality. Dr. King, he lived his life not by the eloquent words that he spoke, but by the fearless actions that he took. Today's action marks a day in Memphis history that is not only significant to Memphis, but is also significant to the world. Memphis, this action shows that we will no longer currently face with the backdrop of inequalities but we will be in the forefront of change. And you know, Memphis, we are faced with so many redefining moments, such as a new unified school system that will allow us to reshape the educational future of our youth throughout the city. As well as renaming this street, Dr. M. L. King Jr. Avenue, which will show the world that we are burying the guilt of Dr. King's assassination for the resurrection of our city's future. Let today serve as a day of hope, a day of transition for which we stand together in order to build better social economics for our city. In the words of Robert F. Kennedy, some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. This street began as my dream, but today, Memphis, it has become all of our reality. Thank you. As I leave you, please remember these short words. It's one of my favorite quotes. It's from a professor named Ashley Montague. And he says that the only measure of what you believe is what you do. If you want to know what people believe, don't read what they write. Don't ask them what they believe. Just observe what they do. Thank you, and may God bless you, and may God keep you. So we're going to have a at this time, we're going to bring out my friend and one of the leaders on the Memphis School Board and the pastor, the pastor of the new Olivet, Pastor Reverend Dr. Kenneth Whalen Jr. Let's give him a big hand.